and welcome Rage Under Game today. I'm David Levin. This is our Friday episode, so we're talking all things inner game. Tuesdays are for sports and sports parenting. Fridays are for everything and everyone. So, how are you today? How are things with your inner game? Feeling good or feeling stressed, worried? What's going on in there? For me, I will say pretty good. More and more goodness. <laughs> There's a little stress around college financing. We'll talk about that in a minute. Always some around work as we're growing the sports academy. But overall, pretty great. I hope that's true for you as well. So some things to talk about today. Of course, my ups and downs for the week. We'll talk about self-regulation and self-mastery and why they're so important. Uh, the news out of the Tennessee legislature. We'll talk about success and the different definitions of that. Uh, some new thoughts on managing diet and appetite. A no news challenge, which is a tough one. And our recommended items. So I will start with ups and downs. What things were lifting me up this past week and what things were pulling me down, making life harder. In the ups column for me this week, I have to start with the weather. We have had some freakishly warm days. 80 yesterday, 80 again today. Tomorrow it looks like maybe air conditioning has come on. It's just unbelievable. And the effect it has is remarkable. And everyone's talking about it. Our kids say, this just makes me happy. We had dinner on the front porch the last couple of nights. Francis had a sleepover outside in the playhouse. It really is just the most wonderful thing, and especially perfect for them because they're on spring break right now. So it just feels totally like summer. It's fantastic. <laughs> now, of course, it's not going to last. This is Wisconsin. Next week's forecast has it freezing one night. Oh, my gosh. Normal temps are, you know, 50s and 60s maybe. And that's actually going to be super hard to go back to that after this. But I'm trying to keep my thoughts focused on how great it is now and not let what's to come harsh my warm weather buzz. The other one I want to mention is that Peter and I went to lacrosse this last week for lunch and a movie. That's what he gave me for Christmas or my birthday this year. And we finally got around to it. And it's just great to have a chance to do things together like that. We both enjoy it. And with him going off to college next year, I'm just super appreciative of these chances because they're not going to be around much longer. Not like this anyway. So that was great. For my downs this week, also college related, we are starting to get into the specifics of college financing now. And it's just a bummer. I mean, it's so much more expensive than we realized, like twice as much as we thought it might be. Of course, we don't want to have him have a bunch of debt when he gets out, but we're just not thinking we're paying anywhere near what it looks like it's going to be. Uh, we don't even know how best to go about financing all that right now. It's just sort of hanging over our heads right now. And it is not fun. Also, this is a weird one, but there's a new book out now by a guy who's pretty famous. And I like him a lot. I'm a fan. He's great. But there's a part of his book, sort of a foundational framework for his book, um, that is uh, almost identical to a foundational part of mine. Now, I don't at all think he got his from mine. And of course, I know I didn't get mine from his, right? The book came out seven years ago. We just apparently both thought hard about how best to explain this aspect of our psychology, and we came up with a very similar explanation for it. It's so similar, in my opinion, that if we were both presenting at the same event and he came on after me, people would think maybe he got his from me and vice versa. Now, like I said, I don't at all think that's the case, but I do think people might suspect that in both directions. If someone reads his book who already knows mine, they might think he got that from me. And more likely, because he's so much bigger, if people read his book and then came across mine or the Academy later, they might think mine came from him. So I'm just trying to figure out what to do with that. It feels weird, obviously, like something should be done, but I really don't know what that would be yet. I don't honestly want to deal with it, but I think I probably need to. And so it's just sort of hanging there nagging at me. It's not a huge thing, but a thing, and that's what downs are, right? So those are my ups and downs this week. Next up, our quote of the week. All right, our quote of the week. 
This week, we'll hear from Epictetus, so we're sticking with the Stoics again this week. Epictetus was another uh, Stoic philosopher. We mentioned Marcus Aurelius last week. We can continue that theme this week with Epictetus and his quote, no one is free who is not master of themselves. No one's free who's not master of themselves. Actually, he said no man is free, of course, who is not master of himself, but I'm confident he meant this is true for everyone. And this is one of those quotes that's easy to miss what it's really saying, or at least maybe miss the power of what it's saying. And the key here is the word free. When you gain control over your thoughts and feelings and impulses, which is what it means to be master of yourself, it gives you a feeling that's hard to describe. It's one of those things you can't really get until you're there, can't really get until you're there. And that's a big part of the struggle I've had all these years in talking about this. You're trying to describe it. You're trying to let people know how great it'll be for them. But it just ends up sounding sort of thin and light and fluffy. You say things like, you'll feel more awake and alive and energized and capable and optimistic and happy. But the reality is, you really will feel all those things. And they will feel truly new and exciting and beautiful. And I'm reminded of that with every coaching call I have with the kids I'm working with in the sports academy. They just feel lighter and free. And they don't talk in those terms, but it's just coming off of them in waves. They're free of all that mental and emotional noise that's been holding them down. It really is beautiful to see. So anyway, I'd like to think that's what he was trying to say, that the work we do to develop self-discipline, self-regulation, self-mastery, create in us the feelings of joy and freedom that I see happening uh, in myself and in the people I work with. So anyway, that is our quote this week. Epictetus, no one is free who is not master of themselves. All right, think about that, and we'll move on to top stories. Okay, top stories. This week, I want to start with a story in Tennessee about the state legislators there who were expelled from the House for a peaceful protest in the chamber. If you don't know, there were three House members who interrupted proceedings to protest following the recent mass shooting in Nashville. They broke the House rules for speaking out of order, no doubt about that. But there are many ways to discipline members for things like that, short of expulsion. They're, that's only supposed to be for the most serious offenses, as you can imagine. But the majority, actually the supermajority, voted to expel them for it. It was unprecedented. And by the way, there were three protesters, two black, one white. Only the black members were expelled. So that is just obviously so wrong in so many ways. I don't actually want to talk about all the details of that. What strikes me is that it's another symptom of a system that has allowed extreme views to exert control without accountability. In any population, there are going to be people who hold views that are at the extreme ends of an issue by definition, and that's fine. People are free to think what they want. A healthy democracy can handle those views because the majority who don't feel that way generally still get to say how things are done. But our system is not working like that anymore. And it's because of, and this word is just not a great word, but gerrymandering, which of course is when political parties draw congressional districts to favor their party. It took me a while to really get how important this is. Again, it's a weird word. It sounded like just political in the weed stuff. But I really do see now that it might be the most important issue for our society. Because what happens is when you get these crazy gerrymandered districts, well, two things happen. First, the most extreme elements of the party get elected because that's who shows up in the primaries. And second, we end up in a minority rule system. You see that clearly in these state houses across the country. Here in Wisconsin, for example, Democrats will win a majority of the votes statewide, but the House ends up two-thirds Republican. That's minority rule. And separate from whether you like the policies or not, minority rule just on its own doesn't work. It's not sustainable. People will not stand for it over time. The only way to sustain minority rule is through authoritarianism and ultimately violence. 
And I know that sounds extreme and reactionary, and of course we're not there yet, thankfully. But that's where it ends up if it goes unchecked. You either have democracy or you don't, and minority rule is not democracy. Another thing that happens, part of what makes it blow up, is unchecked power, supermajorities, no accountability. Again, here in Wisconsin, we just elected a liberal Supreme Court justice by a wide margin. That's an important story on its own. But the rigged legislature now has a supermajority, which means they can literally do whatever they want with no fear of consequences, or at least electoral consequences. And so there are some members who are actually considering impeaching and removing this brand new duly elected judge for no reason other than they don't like her views. So really, truly overturning the democratic will of the people. So this all comes back to the same core issue, the Tennessee expulsion, gun rights, abortion rights, election rights, LGBTQ rights, issue after issue. The majority of people are on the left or center of the issue, but the rulings and the policies and the laws that get passed reflect the minority position because the system is rigged in their favor. And that, again, simply cannot work in the long run. It's not democracy. So the big lesson for me in all this is that we have to lift gerrymandering up in our minds to be a top-level issue. Honest to God, if the system was fair and the majority supported these positions, I could deal with that. But when we know that's not the case, you can feel the cracks starting to form in the foundation. And I do not want to live in a world where America is not a strong vibrant democracy, and I don't think any of us do. The good news is people are fighting back in some places. Michigan passed a referendum recently that created nonpartisan districts, and apparently things there have leveled out in a nice, healthy way. So it can be done, but it won't happen by itself. We all need to get on this and make it happen everywhere possible. So that's the news for me this week. Next up, Inner Game Gold. <laughs> Inner Game Gold, these are the ideas, the concepts I come back to over and over to help me stay on track. This week, keeping with our self-mastery theme, we will touch again on this idea from Leonardo da Vinci. The height of a person's success is gauged by their self-mastery. I open my book with this, and it pretty much says it all. Of course, it's the same basic message as we heard from Epictetus. He talks about freedom, Leonardo talks about success, but they're essentially the same result and they both come from the same source, self-awareness, self-regulation, self-mastery. The one distinction I do like to make is the definition of success. I don't think it needs to mean external success, though for sure, learning to master your thoughts and emotions and impulses is likely to make you much more successful in whatever you're hoping to do, not to mention happier. There's no doubt about that. But I think the real feelings of success and freedom are really internal, how we feel from one moment to the next, how we feel about ourselves and our lives. Those are the things that matter most to us, and they are the things most powerfully connected to self-mastery. So that's our inner game gold this week from Leonardo. The height of a person's success is gauged by their self-mastery. Next up, raise your outer game. All right, raise your outer game where we talk about the things we care about in our outer life, our health, our relationships, our finances. And this week, I want to talk about dieting, but really more about managing appetite, which, of course, is the main part of dieting, at least for me. So I'm thinking about this week because I've been trying to get my appetite back in check for about a month now. I think I might have mentioned that in an earlier pod. And, well, I'm really trying to get five pounds or so back off, but the appetite is obviously the key to getting there. And the truth is, I've not been very successful with it. I know I mentioned this maybe last week, but anyway, my focus has been on and off, and the weight has not moved. By the way, I did lose 25 or so pounds last year using the Noom app, which I really loved. It made all the difference. It's been fantastic being that much thinner, but I have been putting a little bit back on and picking the whole Noom thing back up again has just not been as successful. And that worries me because that's what you hear happens, right? People lose weight, their metabolism resets, 
They don't need as much intake anymore, but their appetite does not reset, and now they put themselves in a situation where the only way to maintain weight is to continue with that feeling of dieting, of taking in less than your body tells you you need, which is stressful and honestly just not sustainable, and so they gain it back. That's my worry, and it's a pretty big one. But anyway, I tried something a bit different this week, and it's actually been working great so far, and it honestly sounds sort of silly. <laughs> I was telling my family about it over dinner, and they basically laughed, but of course none of them have this uh, struggle. But anyway, I wanted to tell you about it in case it's a thing for you. So all I did what was different was change what I said I was doing, how I framed it. Before, when I wanted to get back on track with my intake, my intake I would say something like strict noom or, you know, be strong or something like that. And what I mean is I would put a repeating item on my calendar that says that noom or focus or whatever. So the framing for the goal was to be strong and focused again. And that wasn't really working, not consistently. What has been working is that I changed that framing to burn fat. <laughs> That's what I say I'm doing right now. I'm burning fat. And I get, I get why that's funny. I'm chuckling now as I say it, but it's working, at least for now. Every time I have a moment, and I have them all day, every day, basically, where I'm hungry. I think I really need, you know, something or other, some sort of snack. I say to myself, nope, we're burning fat. And it helps me get through it. It's wow, the difference it's making. So, of course, that's one small story from one moment in time from one person, it might not help you, it might not help me next month, but it's making a big difference right now. I've been basically 100% perfect for coming on two weeks now, whereas before I wasn't able to sustain more than three or four perfect days. So I just thought I would let you know in case. Something about defining the work in a super specific way that's also directly focused on what actually needs to be done, it's making a real difference. When I say, fat burn, and I picture that and think of what it means in the moment. Like, for example, I'm feeling hungry, that feeling you get in your body that unconsciously I think means something bad is happening and I need to grab some food, right, to stop this bad thing. When I say to myself, nope, burning fat, I think, oh, right, that's what that feeling is. We're burning up fat, which is what we want to do. So that's great. Let's keep it up. So anyway, again, it's been helping the past week or two I'll let you know how it goes. So that's my outer game this week. Hope that makes sense and is helpful in some way. Next up, our charging station challenge. All right, last week we had you continue with the lovely 10 minute outdoor walk challenge. Hope you had a chance to do that. This week we're gonna do something that is a lot more, well, challenging. So in addition to the appetite issue, I've been on a terrible news addiction jag for months and months now. And this week, I finally started a news fast again. And it's pretty hard, but it's also pretty great. And so that's what we're going to do this week. Now, maybe you don't check the news all the time, so this is not a problem for you. I hope that's the case. But for the news junkies out there, let's do this together. So my problem is checking the latest news online. I will typically do that six to 10 times a day. And not just check it, but scroll through things for 10, 15, 20 minutes or more. Totally wasteful, stressful, does me no good whatsoever. And now I notice I'm actually just addicted to finding something interesting. It's an endorphin addiction and a boredom issue. It's honestly getting more and more difficult to focus on anything more than a few minutes at a time. It's not good. So a few days ago, I went back on a daily news fast. So what that means for me is I can't check any of my normal news outlets at all. No Times, no Post, no Apple News app. I still check a site called Post.News, which is the Twitter alternate I've been using. So I'm not completely out of touch with what's happening. Also, I won't probably do this every day, probably just six out of seven days. But anyway, that is the challenge. Six days, no checking, any daily news outlet. And as always, let us know what it's like in the community. If you're not in the community yet, click the link in the notes. It's free. Just register. You can go straight into the challenge. We'd love to have you join us. And that's it for this week's Charging Station Challenge. It's a hard one, but I'll tell you what, um, 
And it's still hard. I mean, during the day, even today, I'm like, oh, God, I just really want to read something uh, newsy. But it also feels pretty great to not be doing it. So hopefully you'll join us for that. All right, next up, highly recommended. Okay, highly recommended. This is things I'm crazy about right now. Books, shows, gadgets, etc. And this week, I've actually decided it doesn't have to only be things I love. I can just let you know what I've been checking out and what I make of it. So, for example, the movie Peter and I went to that I mentioned earlier was John Wick 4. And it was fun enough. I'm glad we went. <laughs> but it was also not totally great. I mean, you know sort of what to expect with those. If you know those movies, it's basically a lot of shooting. And I mean a lot of shooting. Beautiful choreography, kung fu, movie sensibility, lots of action. But even Peter, he almost fell asleep at one spot. And it was an action sequence, but it went on for so long. It was like, come on, geez, we get it. There were a couple of lines uh, Keanu said that actually laughed out loud. They were so bad. And the movie had like 94% on Rotten Tomatoes. I don't know what was going on there. But again, overall, fun enough, great to look at if you don't mind blood. Uh, but also sort of dumb. And there you go. Not necessarily highly recommended, but fun enough. I also just finished the Windsor Knot book I mentioned a few weeks ago. Ended up not totally loving that either, honestly. It was fine, but sort of just pretty good. Not a strong ending for me. And anyway, that is it for this week's show. If you like what you heard, please do tell your friends. Invite them to join us and rate and review the show wherever you get your podcast, because, of course, it helps more people find the show and get the mental game boost we all need. If you have teenagers in sports, check out our Mental Game Starter Kit. It's a great set of resources to get you started on the path of helping your child boost their mental game. Just go to RaisingYourGame.com, scroll to the bottom. You can learn about it and register there. All free, of course, super helpful resources there. If you'd like to support the show so we can keep things ad-free, please click the Buy Me a Coffee link below, and thank you for that. For more mental game goodness, please do join our free community, the Raise Your Inner Game Charging Station. Click the link here. Go to raiseyourinnergame.com slash community. It's totally free. You'll love that. If you're listening to this on audio but you like video, we post all our episodes on our YouTube channel as well, and there's a link to that in the show notes. And we'll close again with Leo Tolstoy, again from the Raise Your Inner Game book. The ultimate purpose in life is to serve humanity. That's what we're doing, serving the people in our lives, serving each other. It's super important. Keep up the good work, and we'll see you next time.